Yeah. Okay, let's begin. So, homeworks are due on simulation. If you don't have them turned in, you don't need to scramble to me. Just slide them under my door this weekend. So, um, sorry to you guys that did turn scrambled and got them turned in. Uh, I'm going to look at these next week. It looks like you guys have done a good job. I have in the past received one assignment. It was like that big with like graphs on every page, just one graph, lots of white space. So thank you. So it looks like it's concise. So very good. Um, just a reminder for MCMC projects, they're due by a final exam if you'd like to do it. I think I just received my first one. So this looks just about perfect. So 15% midterm credit. So I can already tell you at a glance, just at looking at this, this seems to work because I can look at the pictures and the QQ plot to verify that this thing is actually working. That's what this says, right, Sam? So I love projects like this, where I can just look at the, the pictures and see that it works in a quick way. So excellent work on that. Myself. I want to pick up and start comparing estimators. So we started the class comparing estimators and looked at a bunch of different estimators. And we talked about which estimators are better than others through a simulation study. And the problem we studied was eerily similar to this one. I mean, this is zero. It doesn't make too much of a difference, but I'll try to make a point with this slightly adjusted example. Um, all those estimators that we derived for that similar example came out of different methodologies whether or not it be maximum likelihood, method of moments, or Bayesian estimators. And I'm going to say a little bit about all of this in the context, context of examples, and then we're going to move more to the theory next week on this. We'll get an idea of what's going on. Some of this is fairly intuitive. Um, we need to say a little bit more about Bayesian estimators. If you're reading the book and following it, they say the Bayes estimator is obviously this thing, and they haven't defined what a Bayes estimator is. And so they're making some assumptions, and I want to kind of go over that a little bit um, and fill in the blanks of what they haven't told you yet. Later in chapter seven, they do tell you what you need to know. And so this is the problem with textbooks is what comes first. It's always like you kind of have to iterate for a little while before you get things right. Um, let's just look at this example again and recap what we saw last time. And I'll talk about um, the Bayesian estimator as well, which we haven't talked about. So um, this problem right here, this is just a Bernoulli model. I'm flipping a coin, and I'm doing it some number of times. Everything in all these examples is IID, and so I'm not going to write it in. Um, this problem has been a little bit elusive in the sense that it depends on how we chose n, how many samples that we actually got. And let me actually just change the notation k, because that's what I used last time in class. So I'm going to sample k times out of all of this. And depending on how I choose k when I stop flipping the coin, there's two different models that can be induced. It could be either a binomial model. And the binomial model is just k choose x. This would be its mass function, p to the x. 1 minus p to the k minus x. I'll write it that way. So this is the number of successes that we're observing. So this x, and I should probably make this a little bit different than these xi's. So the xi's themselves are just ones or zeros. And this x that I'm writing down right here is the total number of successes. So I should probably write that down is cap x is really the sum of the xi's. i goes from 1 to k. So this is the total number of successes. And that's what's random in this model. So the presumption is k was fixed before we ran the experiment. We flipped the coin k times, then we just counted our number of successes, and that's what's random in this model. Um, another underlying assumption that we could have imposed is that this was actually random in the first place. And so I flipped until I saw a total number of successes. And so that's a negative binomial model.
It's kind of a funny name for a distribution. And so you have to go way back and kind of understand this has some inverse sort of property in relationship to the binomial. This could be induced by thinking about the sums of geometric distributions. And if you think about it that way, the name doesn't make much sense. So, but this distribution looks like this. So I'll write it out is x plus y, where this is the number of failures, minus one, choose, and I can write this down a number of different ways. Sometimes I write this down is y down here or x minus one. I'll just put the x minus one down here. So I could have written y and that's what I had done last time. I could also write k up here. So the total number of successes plus the number of failures is the total number of trials. And we could think about the distribution that way. And so this is k as well. So depending on how I think about this, either x is fixed, well x is fixed, and y is random, and that also means k is random. And so we've already discussed this distribution and derived it, and just think about that picture every time you're trying to derive this distribution that we created. So this is going to be p to the x, 1 minus p, and I could write this down as y right here. That's the way I like to write it down, but this is also k minus x. So the number of failures is the total number of trials minus the number of successes. Easy to get hung up on all this stuff, so just practice you know, getting grained in your memory. Um, these two models are very similar to each other. The difference is, is what's random in it. And the question is, is it, does it matter how I conceptualize all this? So the key point here is that this part of the distribution, the part that depends on p, is exactly the same. But the normalizing constant is different. So we showed a couple lectures ago if I computed p-values and I did hypothesis testing using these two different underlying assumptions, I'd get different answers. I'd get different p-values. But the likelihood function is exactly the same. So this is the likelihood. And it's the likelihood as long as I think about this as a function of p and I plug in these numbers, things from my sample. So the likelihood functions are exactly the same. Uh, what I did last time is we derived a whole bunch of estimators. And all the estimators were exactly the same, depending on my methodology. And so let's just kick it off, because I made a mistake at the end of last lecture, and look at the maximum likelihood estimator. So that is called an MLE. So the MLE for this problem is pretty easy to work through, as long as you take logs of everything. Logarithm doesn't change where the maximum of something is because it's a monotonic function. And so the likelihood function for both of these problems is equal to, and I should write down proportional, likelihoods are always defined up to proportionality, um, but a lot of times you'll see people write equal. So you have to just understand what they mean. So this is p to the x, 1 minus p to the k minus x. So regardless of my underlying assumption, the likelihood function is the same. So maximizing this, regardless if I believe the data was generated is a negative binomial or a binomial, it will not change the maximum of this function. And so the constant doesn't matter. So if I look at the logarithm, and this is something that we just do to simplify the problem. We're really just linearizing everything. I'm going to write down like this. Equal to x log p plus k minus x log 1 minus p. In the final maximum, usually what they taught us back in our second semester of calculus is we take a derivative and we set it equal to zero. Now, there are things we need to check. And in high dimensional space, you'd better check. So you need to check the boundary conditions on everything. I'll say more about that next time. But you always have to check and make sure what's living on the boundary. When we study this problem, the parameter is on the boundary, so the maximum actually does live on the boundary. We'll look at that in a couple minutes. You also need to check and make sure you're not at the saddle point. 
So um, all of that stuff that you learned before is still true. So this is an optimization problem and all that stuff you've learned about optimization before applies here. I'll say more about that next time. So it turns out for this problem, the maximum doesn't live on the boundary um, unless you only have like one, k was one or something like that, then the likelihood function is a straight line. It's either p or one minus p. And so that's the only the case there. Um, I guess I should say this. If I see a success and a failure, the maximum doesn't live on the boundary. If I only see all successes, the maximum will live on the boundary. If I see all failures, the maximum will live on the boundary. It'll look like these um, polynomials. So we do need to be more careful than I'm being right now. We'll go into those details later because they're boring. Um, I'll assume you understand all that stuff. So to maximize, I'm going to take derivatives. So after I differentiate this with respect to p log likelihood, and this is going to look like x over p. So the derivative of log of p is 1 over p plus k minus x over 1 minus p. And I have to apply the chain rule. So there's a negative sign there. I set this thing equal to zero, and I instantly made a mistake that would irritate me on an exam. That I've set this equal to p, and as soon as we do that, we've defined an estimator. So we need to be specific. The reason I say all this is because if you write it down wrong in a paper for somebody, they will get irritated, and they'll get annoyed, and they'll cause confusion. So we need to be careful about all of this. I've seen this over and over again, so it seems pedantic, but it's still important. So once we do all of that and we solve for p, I guess we might as well do it since we had made a mistake last time. This is 1 minus p hat over p hat is equal to k minus x over x. And so that implies that 1 over p hat, I'll just take the ratio here, minus 1 is equal to k minus x over x. I'm going to do a quick substitution right here, hit that minus 1, add it over there. I'm going to simplify this even further by making this x over x right there. And so this is k minus x plus x over x, which is equal to k over x. So this is my estimator at the inverse of p. And so p hat is equal to x over k. And that's the number of successes over the number of trials. So the MLA gives us an answer that if we were in second grade, we'd probably figure this out by ourselves and say that's a good estimator. So I don't know if second grade is the right level in which we would have figured this out. But at some point during your, before you were 15, you probably could have said, yeah, I think a good estimator would just be my number of trials. It kind of makes sense. But my number of successes over my number of trials. So it doesn't matter using the maximum likelihood estimator. What I've assumed here, because the only difference is the normalizing constant, and it doesn't involve P. I like that. The MLE does the right thing. So, for the method of moments estimators, and these are called moms, and this usually makes people snicker. So, um, mom jokes are allowed in this class, and we're gonna make plenty of them. So these estimators can be good, and they're often flawed. And it kind of reminds me of my mom. So, <laughs> so I, I, should, I should probably say a little bit more about my family upbringing. <laughs> I do all of this. But I'm going to take my Jackson now. So she's not here, so she'll, she'll be okay. Um, she's pretty rational sometimes, but every once in a while, there were some inconsistencies in there. And I think that that probably is a generalization we could all make. So, um, so I think these, these are aptly named, at least in my experience. Do with that what you will. I obviously need therapy. 
<laughs> Method of Bowman's estimators, and I'll, I'll generalize these for you in a moment. They're not unique, and there's a lot of ways that you can derive them. Which moments you match will make a difference, and we'll see that when we study this example. Um, but let's just see what we get. So for the binomial, What we did is we looked at the expectation, and we have to do it over the random variable, the, the thing that's random. And for the binomial model, that's the number of successes. And I wrote that down as x. I'm going to stop capping that right now. So that's the number of successes. Usually I write conditional on p, just so we know that our expectation is a function of p. So expectations are always a function of the underlying parameters. That's k times p. Number of successes, or the probability times the number of trials. I think that's pretty intuitive. And for the negative binomial, you have to be careful with this one, depending on what I parameterized in terms of the number of failures or the total number of trials. It changes the at least the the aesthetics of the expectation. They really are the same though. But this looks like this. Expectation of y. I usually choose to remember just one of these. This is gonna be, does anybody remember? Nobody? I wrote it down last time. Nobody remembers this one. I'll wait. stress you out for a second so that you remember it from now on. It's good to remember at least some expectations and variances, and then you won't panic on a future midterm. One minus P over P. One minus P over P. <laughs> X times one minus P over P. Now, the X is important here in all of this. That's the number of successes. Remember that thing is fixed. If there was something random that came out of this, um, you know it, it's a mistake. So if, K, if this involved K or Y, we would have just had a big problem. And so, and then we can do a matching. And so for our problem, I'm only dealing with one sample of X. If I thought about this as a binomial distribution, and I've only got one sample. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to match this and say that this is approximately x. The expected value of x is probably around x. Now, my notation is a little bit butchered right here. This is the random variable. This is the observed value. So I probably want to denote that a little bit differently. And so, but on the chalkboard, it's a little bit difficult to do. So just keep that in mind. This thing is approximately y for the same reasons. The expected number of failures is approximately y. And if I solve for p in both of these, if I actually make the match, so this is going to be k times p is equal to x, I need to do the same thing and denote that I've just defined an estimator by doing this, by doing this match. And I put a half over it. This is method of moments by doing that, this procedure that I'm following. And so I'm matching moments. So method of moments is matching theoretical moments to empirical moments. If I had more than one sample, then this would be an arithmetic average that I would match it to. Since I only have one sample, the arithmetic average of one sample is just that thing. And so that means that p hat is equal to x over k. And if I do the same exact thing over here and I solve, the solve is going to involve that exact same math that we just did. So I'll not spoil our time, and I'll just tell us what the answer is. So if I ended up taking x, 1 minus p hat over p hat, and I set it equal to y, what I'd end up getting is p hat is equal to, I'll write it out this way, um, is x over x plus y is what I would get, and I would notice that x plus y is k. I get exactly the same answer. 
So all three of these different calculations I did came up with exactly the same answer, and we're inclined to think, perfect. There's no disagreement between these methods. Now we did kind of dwell on the fact that when I did this calculation right here, I did not violate the likelihood principle. And the likelihood principle induces the sufficiency principle, and it induces the conditionality principle. And so in a principled fashion, I came up with this estimator. This method, because I didn't use the likelihood function at all, I'm really just averaging over x, and I'm using moments and not likelihood functions. While I came up with the same answer, I violated the likelihood principle. This is the part of the likelihood principle, the debate that everybody hates, is that it doesn't matter how I came up with the answer. Really. And so these were just principles. As long as I use this answer, it's OK. Some statisticians don't think that's OK. They think that you need to explain it in a principled manner. And it depends on which camp of statisticians you're talking to. Back in the 80s, people were rather feisty about this. Nowadays, since we use computers and we have simulations and we can just do comparisons, it's really just kind of a moot point, I think. Um, we'll come back around to that point right here. So, in a moment. So, maybe it matters whether or not we like the likelihood principle, and maybe it doesn't. Let's do a Bayesian calculation and see what Bayesian will do. And we'll discuss the likelihood principle just briefly. So, Bayes. Grace, is this new? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you'll be really impressed. Um, we've been studying this exact same problem and being able to visualize what this posterior distribution is and how cool it is is kind of key to you liking this analysis. We're not going to do that right now. We're just going to do it all on the chalkboard. All of these guys are already very impressed with this. So at least what the likelihood function looks like. So the Bayesian calculation always is the same thing. All Bayesians do this. So they come up with a posterior distribution. So this is my posterior. So it means conditional on seeing the data. I build a probability distribution around the unknown thing. So all Bayesians do the same thing. They build a distribution on the things that they don't know and the condition on the things that they do know. I like that. So and I put a probability measure directly on that. So I like the interpretability of it. Of course, it depends what kind of Bayesian you are. And of course, the prior distribution can have some impacts. And so this is always the likelihood function times the prior distribution. And then I need to normalize. And so in the context of our problem, that's the likelihood times some prior distribution. And then I divide by whatever normalizes this so that when I integrate over this distribution, it integrates to 1. That's all probability distributions need to do. Um, and so all this is is really just a plug and shut. We've already discussed a prior that we like. And so let's see if you actually do like that prior. So this looks like this. I just plug in the likelihood. Again, I don't really care what the normalizing constant is in all of this. And so I'm just going to write down q to the x, 1 minus p to the k minus x. I'll write in my normalizing constant right here, whether or not this is the normalizing constant for the for the binomial or the negative binomial, it doesn't actually matter. So when I write this down, whatever that normalizing constant is, 1 minus p, k minus x, times the prior distribution, this c cancels. It doesn't involve p. I can factorize that side out of the integration, and it cancels. That's a nice thing. So just look at what the Bayesian is doing 
when they're playing around with likelihoods, they're always playing around with them in some ratio form. So not directly, but through this, through this application of Bayes' rule. And so it doesn't matter what the normalizing constant is. Question is, is what is the prior? Now you guys have studied for a while this problem and you've done a big simulation study on a problem that's similar to this. What prior do you like so far? Conjugate. Conjugate prior, so good. So that makes it easy, at least. So maybe a conjugate prior. So whatever the form of this thing is, the posterior will have the same form. So what's the conjugate prior? It's beta distribution. So beta. And betas have two parameters in them. I'm going to call them alpha and beta. And what that looks like is p to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus p to the beta minus 1. And out in front of this thing right here, there's what's known as a beta function. It's the thing that integrate makes this thing integrate to one. So lots of betas running around the beta, and they're all different. So there's the distribution, the beta kernel, I've got beta as a hyperparameter, and I've got a beta function. And so if I'm just talking to somebody, this could get confusing. So um, hopefully you're not confused by this anymore. And of course, to do a proper Bayesian analysis, and this is where a lot of people get hung up and they'll start arguing with each other, is how do I pick those? What do you like so far? I'm not saying you need a strong opinion about this because you probably are just starting to experience this for the first time. So if somebody came in and said, I need an answer right now. I need it to be a Bayesian answer. I don't know why my advisor said, and I need you to pick some hyperparameters for me. What would you choose? Oh, thank you. So, I was hoping you would say that. So, one half, one half. Now, I know you guys don't know all the reasons for this. What this distribution looks like is it looks like this. So, 0 to 1, this is P. This is going to be my posterior distribution, or my prior distribution. And the beta, one half, one half looks like that. This is 1 over here. And so, it's asymptoting into those lines. What it's doing is it's penalizing these sides. So if P was very large or P was very small, it would add a little bit of incremental penalty to everything. And so it's really doing an adjustment so that if you do have small P or big P, um, let's just think about our basic answer that we've been coming up with from all of our other stuff. This is the number of successes over the total number of trials. So let's imagine for a second um, P was very small and K was relatively small. If that were the case, then my um, mom estimator or my MLEs in this case would be zero. So let's just think about this a little bit. So imagine I wanted to estimate the number of fish in the sea. Have I done this example yet? So let's imagine I wanted to estimate the total number of fish in the sea. I'm a statistician, so I have permission to design an experiment. You can let me know what you think of this experiment a little afterwards, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'm going to get a cup. And I'm going to go out to, this, to the ocean, and I'm going to scoop up at random a scoop of ocean water in my cup. And then I'm going to count the number of fish that I have in my cup. And then, for some strange reason, I happen to know what the volume of the ocean is. I think you realize there's all these questions out here that have an answer, but we'll never know what they are. So the volume of ocean water is something I can't actually calculate. Here's even something that's just as elusive, but maybe a little bit seems simpler, is what is the um, area of or I, I should say maybe the length of the um, boundary of the United States. So what is the length of oceanfront property of the United States? There's no real answer to this. So it's changing all the time. So, and depending on the method you use to estimate that, you come up with wildly different answers. 
So it's kind of an interesting question. There's all these things that we don't really know. Let's assume that I know the amount of volume of the sea. What I would do is I would take my number of fish that I just <coughs> got in my cup, I would take the ratio of the volume of ocean divided by the volume of water in my cup, I would take that division and I'd multiply it by the number of fish in here. That would be the NLE. That would be equivalent to this answer that we've been coming up with, the total number of successes over the total number of trials. Those are equivalent answers. And if I did that experiment, I would come up with zero. And the reason why is the number of fish in the sea, the volume of them compared to the ocean is very tiny. So that's very similar to a very, very small sea. And so even a big N can't get you past that, or K in our case. And so I would come up with zero. So the, the NLE, or the mom estimator as derived right there, is not a very good answer. And so the Bayesian is not putting a big penalty in here, but they're putting big penalties next to the boundary. They're really just regularizing the likelihood. And maybe you'd like to think about it that way. That I'm taking a likelihood function and I'm constraining it somehow. So this is almost like constrained likelihood. The Bayesian does one more thing for you that they put everything on a probability scale so we know it is big and we know it is small. That's kind of my engineering way of thinking about Bayes. And if you like to think about it that way, good. Sometimes I think about Bayes exactly that way. So if you like likelihood functions and you like constraints, being a Bayesian doesn't seem so elusive anymore. So if you like thinking about things that are very likely to happen as probability one, and things that are very unlikely to happen, not the same likely as in the likelihood function, the English way of using the word, the way they use it on like CSI or something like that. Um, but if you think things are unlikely, then you might say it's close to probability zero. So the Bayesian ends up coming up with a different answer from the MLE or, or the person doing the mom estimation. So if I do this, and I come up with this likelihood function, I want to point out, again, this normalizer doesn't really help us to understand what the distribution is. All I have to look is in the numerator, because the numerator contains all the p's, which is how it, the distribution is defined. There are no p's down in the denominator because I've integrated them out. And so if you're in a midterm or a final, you're doing an integration with respect to a variable, and that variable is still there, you've made a critical error. One of you will make this error on the next one. So I hope it's not any of you. So it's happened every year for 13 years. So, so make sure you don't do that. So the likelihood times the prior. Without saying more about the prior distribution, but I will say a couple things. This is the, it's invariant to transformations as prior. It's optimal frequentist, meaning if I come up with credible intervals, they cover at an optimal frequentist rate. So if I use the highest density intervals. And so this Bayesian analysis should even appeal to a frequentist. So this is going to look like this. <coughs> P to the x, 1 minus P to the k minus x times p to the 1 half minus 1, that's my first hyperparameter, 1 minus p to the theta minus 1. I'll do a little simplification. This is x plus 1 half minus 1, 1 minus p to the k minus x plus 1 half minus 1. And I recognize this is the kernel of a beta distribution. So this is some beta disk really the density function. It looks just like this thing. It looks like the prior. And I recognize the parameters by isolating the exponents from its negative one. And so this is a beta x plus one half k minus x plus one half. Okay, quick question. What's the expectation of a beta? 
alpha over alpha plus beta. Just a little bit of class up. To knock that guy off his lap. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would be terrible. <laughs> so, uh, the expectation of a beta in the prior is alpha over alpha plus beta. In our case, those parameters have been updated through the data. That's how a Bayesian will think about this. So this is my alpha, and this is my new beta. I usually call this alpha tilde and beta tilde. And so the expectation of my posterior distribution is equal to x plus 1 half over x plus 1 half plus k minus x plus 1 half. Just keep in mind this expectation needs to live between 0 and 1. And so if you are on a midterm, you're trying to remember what's the expectation of this thing. It's the one that lives between 0 and 1. Very common mistake is to write this down as an alpha over beta, which is the expectation of a gamma, or depending on how you parameterize it. All good things to remember. So I'll do a simplification, the Bayesian solution, the Bayesian estimator, is x plus 1 half over x minus x, so those cancel each other. I've got the 1 half plus the 1 half plus the k. So I'll just write this down as k plus 1. Did I make a mistake? No. You always me. <laughs> so this is similar. It's not the number of successes over the number of trials, but it's a penalized form of that. So it's very close. If k was big and x was big, or the probabilities were relatively large, so x was big, right here, these wouldn't have much influence. So I should say asymptotically, as k gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this converges to the other solution. So in an asymptotic sense, everybody agrees. In a non-asymptotic sense, for small sample sizes and small p, this answer will be different. And this answer, in my opinion, is a bit better. So because I don't want to ever report things like, what do I think p is? I'll never say 0, and I'll never say 1. So because that means you're certain about something. And so as statisticians, we need to always express our uncertainty, and we never want to be absolute about these things. So anything that I think is even relatively possible, I'll never cut zero mass on. And so and I think that's kind of the key point. So this is a bit different than the other answer. Let me ask you a question. Does this violate the likelihood principle? I don't expect you to um, feel really solid about this answer either. What do you think? It's hard to say, right? Do you guys care? <laughs> For some reason, I care about this so much, and it's made me agonize. I probably lost nights of sleep over this. Here's the real answer. It depends. And this is exactly. So I'd like to wean people off of arguing about the likelihood principle, because it's a little bit silly. But you still will hear people have dramatic arguments about it. In fact, years ago, I was at a conference. This was my first year of graduate school. I went to Carnegie Mellon University for a Bayesian conference. And there became a shouting match in one of the <laughs> sessions over whether or not the frequentist answer and the Bayesian answer was right. You know, there was this argument of whether or not the Bayesian answer was frequentist and whether or not violating the likelihood principle uh, that Dave Hickman, our department head, was part of that argument as well. 
they were doing a little skit on stage trying to express a point. And it was basically somebody had won a Nobel Prize, but they violated the likelihood principle. And then all of a sudden they had to give back their Nobel Prize. And you know, they were in ruins and were living on the street, and somebody didn't like the analogy and started the screen and yelling. That was Larry Wasserman. So it was pretty good. Dave West Dave, he was just like, what the heck? <laughs> but some other people on the stage started yelling back. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. So I did like it because it was very exciting. It woke me up from the conference, but it was pretty unusable. So as a grad student, I don't think you like that kind of stuff. It's like, can't we just agree? So it depends if I, it depends on how I derive the prior is the real answer. And so it depends on how I think about the prior. And so if the assumption is, is we all agree with this prior and we would have used it anyway. And I didn't derive it and I didn't derive it using things outside of the likelihood function. Um, I just believe my a priori subjective beliefs are the, this. Nobody actually does that. So I think what people do to induce this prior is they either look at the reference analysis or the Jeffries prior. And there is a way to derive this prior by um, talking about optimality conditions of the posterior. So we really don't think about the prior itself. We think about its impact on the posterior distribution. And a lot of times when you do that, you are violating the likelihood principle. So I went back and forth as to whether or not the Bayesian is actually violating the likelihood principle here. And the silly answer to this is they might be, depending on how you think about the prior. So if you think about it as a Jeffries prior, the Jeffries prior is a violation of the likelihood principle. And I'll talk about that later. So it depends. So I'll side with Piper today on this one and say, yeah, I don't, I, don't really, I don't really care about the likelihood principle today. Still fun to talk about. Okay, so that's the Bayesian answer. Let's do a little bit more motivation. So they all kind of agree with each other in some sense. Let's look at this other example and see how everything works out. Let's start with the mom estimator. So this is a uniform distribution, and I really don't care how many X's you see right here. I'm going to say you've got one. Jenny? We thought that I wanted to quickly ask, what is the advantage of using the, uh, the mean for that posterior versus the maximum? Thank you. Posterior? Yeah, very good. So I had written down estimator in quotes up on the board. I just erased it. The book does it at that point. When they run through this analysis, they do it for the same exact problem in the book. They say the Bayesian estimator is the mean. And there's an assumption. And so we haven't studied this yet. But if you've studied decision theory, and we'll be getting around to this later in chapter 7, you have to come up with a loss function. And the idea is, if you're wrong about your answer, how much do you want to penalize yourself? And so Bayes estimators are defined through a loss estimator. So you have to put that in up front. And if you ended up penalizing yourself in a quadratic form, that induces the mean as your estimator. So if you build in a squared error loss, so if I take p hat minus true p and I square it, and I think about that is my loss function, and I try to optimize that by trying to minimize that loss, the posterior mean is the solution to that. And so the Bayes estimator is not defined until you define your loss function. And that's the part that they sweep under the rug and they come back around to it later. So they kind of just, they're doing that thing that I, I try to get you guys away from, that they say that the mean is, you know, that's the, that's the right point estimator because that's the one we learned probably in second grade. I think it was seventh grade. So it's when I learned what the mean was, something like that. So um, to answer your question a little bit more, if we ended up looking at the absolute loss, so absolute value of p hat minus p, and I try to minimize that, the posterior median is the solution. If you ended up um, looking at the, um, if I try to just maximize 
what I'm looking at in the map estimator, the maximum a posteriori estimator, is going to be your um, your, est your estimator. Let me say that again. I use zero one loss. So if I get the answer right, I score myself as a zero loss. If I get the answer wrong, no matter how far away I am from the answer, I give myself just a, a loss of one. Or it could be a constant that you choose. Um, that will induce the maximum mean posterior yes. Let's wait to come back around to that. So I think what they were trying to do is not bombard you with a bunch of theory in these early examples of the book. Very good question. So we do need to circle back around to that. Let's look at the bomb estimator for this example, if there's no more questions. Sorry, this is already then we're assuming this Bayesian estimator is still the mean. Yeah, for right now. So without, yeah, exactly. I'm just saying there's a way to derive an estimator that's similar to the other estimators. So let's not get too overwhelmed by what is the theory of Bayes estimators yet. So I did use the mean. So again, we'll do more theory later. So let's do this problem right here. So what's the expectation of x? It's zero. So right in the middle. Right here. You didn't even need to do a calculation. So we're already busted on the method of moments estimator. So if I did this and I said this is approximately x, right here, this doesn't have the p's in there, doesn't have the betas in there, I should say. They're gone. And so I can't match that. I can't do anything with this. So the method of moments estimator fails completely. So, mom estimators are kind of a heuristic. They can work sometimes. You can derive things with them, but there's no guarantee that the answer even makes any sense. There's a problem in the book where you're trying to estimate something. It's actually an estimation on the number of samples in a binomial distribution. And what they derive is something that's negative using a mom estimator. And that's obviously not a good answer. So moms can do really erratic things. So back to my pun. So insert joke there. So this doesn't work right here. But what you could do is you could match a different moment. So I can look at the second moment and do a match there. Does anybody know what the second moment is? In this case, it's the variance because the expectation is zero. So the variance of x right here is equal to the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x all squared. So something I can never forget because this is usually how I compute variances. This thing is zero right here. So the second moment is the variance. Does anybody know what the variance of the uniform distribution is? Yeah. That 12 thing is so like always in, yeah, exactly. Something squared. It's the interval length divided by 12. So. What's that? The noble length squared. Yeah, that's that's what I meant to say. So the length of the interval is two theta. I'm going to square it and divide by 12. So what am I going to match this to? I'm going to match it to x squared. So, because that's what I expect it to be. If I add more than one sample, I would average over the x squares. And that's what the method of moments would do. I'll generalize this for you on Monday. So, if I solve for all of this, and I write down 2 theta, and put a hat on there, square this thing out, times 12, and I match this to x squared, I can come up with a solution for this. So, I'll just do this real quickly. So I'll do squared, multiply this by 12, take the square root, divide by 2. The question is, is, do you like that estimator? And what are its properties? We should probably discuss the NLE real quickly, but I'm just going to say, and we'll pick up with this next time, the likelihood function for this problem 
we need to end up right now. If I have more than one sample, the likelihood function actually looks like this. And we're going to have to talk about it. So we're going to derive this next time. So what I want you to think about is the likelihood function, and you should come up with a picture like this. That the maximum likelihood on this problem lives on the boundary. And the maximum likelihood is the maximum order statistic. There's a lot of details that I need to go through. I don't have time to do it right now. But my quick question to you is, what answer do you think is better? This, and this does live between negative theta and theta, or this. It's hard to answer right now. But I want you to think about sufficient statistics and which one it contains a sufficient statistic. And so the mom estimator does not rely on a sufficient statistic. But the maximum likelihood estimator always has the sufficient statistic built in. And it turns out the MLD will wall up this other estimator. The mom estimator is unbiased. The MLE is biased. But it has much lower variance. Those are all the things that we're going to talk about through chapter 7, and we'll develop theory around those thought processes. But I think our principles are guiding lights, and they can help us out. That if you don't have the sufficient statistic built into your estimator, you can beat it under any loss function. Okay, that's it for now, you guys. Have a great weekend. Um, if you're on the schedule, I'll see you later today. <laughs>